the worst thing about working in tech, uh, there isn't a worst thing. I think it's great. Hi, I'm Dr. Sue Black. I'm a computer scientist, the author of Saving Bletchley Park. I set up the BCS Women Network to connect together women in tech. I'm a social entrepreneur. I run uh, an enterprise called Tech Mums, and I'm also a woman in tech. A typical day for me, well, there, there isn't a typical day for me. I do something different every day, really. So I now run my social enterprise Tech Mums. Uh, which is all about empowering mums through teaching them tech skills, giving them more confidence, helping them to, to understand stuff like social media, but also coding and web design, app design. So I'm doing various different things as part of that project. Um, for example, tomorrow I'm going to Warsaw uh, to talk to uh, mums and uh, people who work for, work for Homestart there. Uh, and then on Thursday, I'm in Essex talking to mums and people that work for Homestart. Then on uh, Monday, I'm flying to Orlando, so I'm, at, I'm giving a speech in front of 18,000 people on Wednesday next week, I think. And I'm accepting an award for, for like international social impact, so that'll be exciting. Uh, and then I come back and then I'm teaching some um, teachers in Wales how to teach tech mums. So, I mean, every day is different, really. <laughs> no, I haven't got a lot going on. <laughs> oh, and no, I'm also writing um, the Pelican Guide to Coding for Penguin. So I think technology is a massive enabler for everybody. So when I went into, went back into education at the age of about 26, there wasn't any online education uh, like there is now. So technology provides amazing opportunities, even just in the fact that it provides a platform that can help people to learn stuff but they don't have to go anywhere, you know, like you don't have to go to college or school to another building, it's actually on your computer at home. Because classes ran between nine and six, I, at uni I only managed to get to class between ten and two because I had to take my kids to school at um, nine and, and pick them up at three, so I only had four hours a day out of the sort of eight or nine hour day. Uh, whereas now, of course, most learning stuff is all online as well as in the classroom. So I think particularly for people that have, you know, can't just kind of drop everything and, and go to uni every day, uh, it provides a massive opportunity. Gosh, what is a woman in tech to me? Um, that's a really hard question to answer because the thing is, for me, technology is now kind of pervading everything that we do. So I think actually that kind of term of being in tech is going to gradually disappear because practically every job, if not every job, is going to involve some technology. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is helping everyone to understand just the basics of technology. So the kind of stuff that we do with Tech Mums, you know, learning basic coding, basic app design, basic web design, everyone can do that because we teach it to mums who are market store holders um, or, you know, they, they could just come from any background. So anyone can learn that kind of stuff and I think that Actually, I think the government should be funding massive support to reskill people in tech. The best thing about technology is that it now underpins everything that we do, and all the best people work in tech, and that gets that, that means that I get to have them as my friends. <laughs> For someone who wants to get into tech but doesn't think they have the right background or the right skills, I would say just look online. I mean, there's, there's so much online now. I'm a Twitter addict, so I would say get on Twitter and start finding people that you think you have some rapport with, maybe a woman in tech like me. Um, I'm at Dr Black on Twitter and uh, have a chat with me and, you know, there's, there's so many women out there, there's so many people out there that care about helping other people get into tech, that you'll find someone who uh, wants to have a chat with you and support you. What surprised me about working in the tech industry? Um, I guess just that the rate of change is so slow. Uh, I think that's kind of surprised me in life in general. You know, like starting a group for women in tech 20 years ago, um, I thought, you know, things would have dramatically changed in like two or three years, but that's 20 years ago now, and now I'm starting to really see a change. But that's 20 years, you know, that's a whole life of an adult. So, you know, I found, found it quite sad in a way that 
the things that I was struggling with when I was in my 20s. My daughter, who's 33 now, she's had to struggle with some of the same things. And then, you know, my first granddaughter's due next month. Is she going to have the same things again? You know, that, that kind of makes me a bit sad, but also determined to, to carry on trying to make change happen. Lots of technology companies will have misogyny within them because our whole culture is misogynist, so it's just a reflection of that. I don't specifically think tech companies are any worse than any other companies, um, so I don't think misogyny is a, is a tech issue. So thinking back to 20 years ago, kind of the mainstream was not interested in women in tech at all. You know, I was asked why I was ghettoising myself for setting up a group for women in computing. Um, you know, people would say quite openly, and men and women, not just men, would say things like, well, you know, why aren't you creating a group for men? You know, men need a group too. And I'd just be like, well, this is a men's group and I'm creating a women's group kind of inside of that for us to chat. So, again, not everyone's on board with this yet, but, you know, there's a massive change now in that we're talking about a thing called women in tech that just didn't really exist. Women in tech have got a massive, massive voice, which we just didn't have 20 years ago. So, various things give me hope for the future. I'm very positive about the future. Um, I absolutely love the way that uh, minorities are being able to connect with each other through technology. So Black Lives Matter, you know, down to women in tech, just the fact that I can put women in tech hashtag into Twitter and find millions of women in tech. Um, I love that and I think what's going to happen is as we find each other we will be able to work out how to make the world a better place. All minority groups are now able to have a voice and we haven't got those same old like big power structures that we couldn't really do anything about. We can now break them down. So technology is disrupting in just so many different ways. It's empowering people, it's empowering individuals, it's empowering groups, it's enabling people to see what other people are doing in other countries. It's allowing people that want to solve the world's problems to find each other and connect with each other and share their experience. So I'm ridiculously positive about the future, but it can't come fast enough. <laughs> Bletchley Park is the place where the code breakers worked during the Second World War. I, the first time I went there, I thought that maybe about 50 old blokes worked there. Um, so on my first visit, I was surprised to find that actually more than half the people that worked there were women and that more than 10,000 people worked there. So I was completely blown away by the fact that more than 5,000 women worked at Bletchley Park. Uh, most of them were uh, doing particularly kind of menial tasks, uh, very repetitive tasks, because apparently uh, women are very good at doing boring repetitive tasks, <laughs> or that's what the thinking was during World War II. Um, but some of the women were code breakers, like Mavis Beatty, who was actually only 18 uh, when she was a code breaker there. And uh, she, in, in her work as a code breaker, managed to save hundreds, if not thousands, of lives from, from what she did. I later on found out that the work that was done there was said to have shortened the war by two years. And at that time, 11 million people a year were dying. So potentially the work that was done at Bletchley Park saved 22 million lives. In 2008, I found out that Bletchley Park might have to close because they were having issues with funding. So at that time I was head of a computer science department at the University of Westminster. Um, I, I thought that was wrong, I was horrified at that fact, so I decided to start a campaign to save it. So I wrote the book Saving Bletchley Park because I really wanted to get the story out there of what happens at Bletchley Park to start with. But also I wanted to kind of get that story out there of the social media campaign that we ran. So the book tells the story all the way through of what we did using Twitter, how I got Stephen Fry involved, how I ended up on Breakfast Time Drunk. <laughs> Maybe cut that bit out, I don't know. <laughs> and, and all sorts of adventures uh, that we had along the way. And someone just recently said to me that it's actually a sort of social media primer on how to run a, a social media campaign. So it's that along with Code Breakers, the women that worked at Bletchley Park, Alan Turing, Enigma, just kind of anything you ever wanted to know about Bletchley Park too. One of the things that I'm doing at the moment actually is talking to uh, someone about writing a screenplay for a film uh, which is about the women that worked at Bletchley Park and also the campaign to save it. So The Imitation Game is a great film uh, about Bletchley Park and uh, that actually came out four years after the campaign finished. 
Um, but it's, it's a very interesting film because, of course, you know, I ran a campaign for three years from 2008 till 2011 to save Bletchley Park. Um, and one of the things I really wanted was for something like a feature film about Bletchley Park to be out there. So it's like my dream that something like The Imitation Game happened. So that's amazing. It, you know, it's great that it kind of continues to get the Bletchley Park story out there. Um, one of the funny things about The Imitation Game uh, is that a lot of the story is not true. Uh, in the film, which I guess is always like a trade-off, right? You can't have exactly the story of what actually happened, as in Alan Turing didn't build the machine that he builds uh, in the imitation game, but he did design it, or he did kind of invent the theoretical model for the machine. Um, and also, there's one woman in it rather than 8,000 women. <laughs> but um, the film of my book is going to sort that out. Ha, 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 ha.